Hello and welcome again. So in this video, I want to give you some more practice problems so that you get familiar with the concepts that we've been doing. And then I want to give a brief overview on the probabilistic nature of the wave function. So by now you should know that in quantum mechanics, we're going to be dealing exclusively with probabilities. Right? From the double slit experiment, we saw that in quantum mechanics, we can't really know many things with 100% certainty. There are some things we can know with 100% certainty, but most of the things we can't know. Um, so anyways, here's my practice problem. And the practice problem is show that e to the exponent i k x is an eigenfunction of the momentum operator. So remember, it's the momentum operator in the x direction because we're only talking about a one directional system. So the question is, show that this is an eigenfunction of p of x. So first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly drive um, this operator so that it gives us some practice. So this operator comes from the kinetic energy operator, which is simply negative h bar squared 2m d squared over dx squared. And then I said that classically, kinetic energy can be written as p squared over 2m. Using this substitution, I can say that p squared over 2m is equal to negative h bar squared over 2m d squared over dx squared. The 2m's cancel. So then I said that negative 1 can be written as i squared. Um, and that's because i is equal to square root of negative 1. So if you square both of these, um, then you get this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that negative this negative by i squared then of course I have h bar squared then I have d squared over dx squared so what this implies is that momentum the momentum operator is simply i h bar d over dx okay so now that we have the momentum operator we are asked show that this is an eigenfunction of p of x Okay, so we know that any eigen eigen any eigen problem can be formulated in this in this form. So we're gonna use this um, prescription and we're gonna solve this problem. It's quite easy. So we have i h bar, which is um, i h bar d over dx. Okay, that's the operator, and the function is e to the exponent i k x, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, i, k, x. And now we simply just do the math. So the i, h part is a constant and really nothing happens to it. So you take the derivative of e, i to the k, x. And remember, how do you take derivative of um, functions that are exponentials involving e? Well, the, the e part remains the same. And then you take the exponent's derivative. And that's the whole rule. So we have i h cross. The derivative of i k x is simply i k because i k are both constants, right? i is always equal to square root of negative 1, so it's a constant. k is some constant as well. It's actually the spring constant, but whatever. You don't need to know that for now. So this derivative is going to be i k, okay? And then, of course, we're going to have this e to the exponent i k x. So we can simplify this a little bit to get i squared h bar k um, so, Wow, I, I'm so sorry, but what I did is I forgot um, I forgot a negative sign here. Okay. So there's a negative sign there, negative i h cross um, d over dx. So don't forget that negative sign. 
there's a negative here, there's a negative here, there's a negative here. So I squared is itself is equal to negative 1. So negative 1 times negative is just equal to positive h bar k e to the exponent i k x. So the eigenvalue is this. And this is, of course, the eigenfunction of the momentum operator. Now, I really want to just finish off things um, by discussing two things. And the first thing is that the order of operators matter. So this is the first thing I want to talk about. So if you have two different operators, let's say we have A and B, then what I mean by that the order of operators matter is that if A and B are acting on some function f of x, then it is not always going to be the case that this relationship is true. You know, there will be some special cases in which this will be true, but in the majority of the cases, um, you can't switch these operators around and expect the answer to be the same, okay? So that that is one really important thing, that the order of operators um, matters, right? So we can easily prove this by... Um, we can easily prove this by, let's say, making an example, okay? So assume that a bar is equal to x squared. So this is also an operator. You might get a little bit confused. Let's say it's 3x squared, okay? You might get a little bit confused, um, but all this operator is saying is multiply this by your function f of x. So this is also an operation, right? Mathematical operation. And let's say b is equal to d over dx, d squared over dx squared, right? Let's say it's this. So I want to see, um, is this relationship true? So first let's go, first let's go 3x squared, so which is a bar, a hat, and then d squared over dx squared, and let's say this is acting on some function f of x. And I want to see, is it equal if I did d squared over dx squared, and then I did x, 3x squared, f of x. So are these two equal? No, they're not, right? Here, 3x squared is acting as a constant, and this derivative is only acting on f of x. But here, this derivative is acting on 3x squared and f of x. So, so this is not going to be equal. So it's very important knowing that don't get, don't make this mistake, okay? You have to be very careful about the order of the operators. So that's something you should be mindful about. Um, it is, it is helpful. So what I want to do is I, I, I want to clarify um, the derivation of the momentum operator because I think um, some people might be confused about the sign that's involved with the momentum operator. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to, I'm just going to drive it again so you know that the, the kinetic energy operator is negative h bar squared over 2m d squared over dx squared. Then the momentum operator squared is simply negative h bar squared d squared over dx squared. Right? The two m's cancel. Um, you should follow this along from the previous steps. So then I can rewrite this as negative i h bar d over dx times negative i h bar d over dx, right? So the negative and the negative become positive, and then i squared is just equal to negative 1, so then this relationship is equal to this. 
So um, just make sure that you know that the momentum operator is in fact negative i h d over dx. So I, I'm not sure if I made a mistake um, when I was driving this originally. Um, so just make sure that you keep track that the momentum operator is this. So now the last thing I want to talk about is the probabilistic probabilistic um right now it is very late where I'm at so excuse my spelling so probabilistic interpretation of the wave function so what that so I'm just going to explain this um in, in a little bit of detail right now just so that you guys have some familiarity with the concepts we'll build on these concepts a little bit deeper as we go along right now I'm just throwing a lot of information at you so that you have an idea of what to expect so if if you if you see many things right now then the next time you see them um, since you'll be familiar with them it won't seem so hard so this is why I'm going to talk a little bit about the probabilistic interpretation um, before I've actually you know before I've actually started um, talking about quantum mechanics in, in depth so what what this means on the surface is that psi of X alone it has no physical significance it has no physical meaning so in fact if if I was just given psi of X as, as a function um, it's useless to me. It, it doesn't have any physical meaning. It doesn't translate to the physical world. So, so what is the use of psi of x? Should I just throw quantum mechanics out of the window and be like, okay, goodbye. This is this is all you need to know about the field. Um, psi of x has no physical meaning. No, it would be very silly to do that. Um, and the reason being is that psi of x doesn't have a meaning, but the square of psi definitely does. So psi of x gives us square of psi, right? Without psi of x, we couldn't calculate its square. So psi of x is extremely important, um, and it has it has a million other um, importances as well. So um, we'll talk about that later. But right now, what I want to tell you is, for phys for physical significance, psi of x doesn't really have any physical significance. The only thing that has physical significance is psi x squared. And what does psi x squared represent? It represents the probability density Of finding an electron okay so it just gives you density of finding an electron um, somewhere in space so what I mean by that is assume that psi of x so let's say you have x and you plot it against psi of x okay so if your function psi of x looks something like this here um, I'm just gonna extend this like this so let's say psi of x looks like this so then the graph of psi squared of x would look something like this so this would get squared and it would have a bigger height so here the answer would be zero because at this point it's still zero but now the square of any negative number is positive so then this would look something like this okay then I'd come back to the nodal point and then it would look something like this so this over here is the probability density of finding an electron so basically you're more likely to find an electron here here and here and you're less likely to find an electron um, in this region and this region um, and this region right so that's what I mean by probability density uh, so one last thing is that remember density is equal to mass per unit 
volume. So if you want to find quote unquote mass, you have to go density times volume and it gives you mass. So some specific value. So same if, if I don't want to find the density, but I want to find the probability of finding an electron or any particle. So if I want to find the probability of finding in a particle, then what I have to do is I have to take my probability density and then I have to multiply it by some volume element. So here the volume element is simply just dx, right? Um, if this was 3D, then it would be dx, dy, dz. But since it's only dx, this is um, this is going to be the probability p of x in 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 the region um, x dx in the region of dx is this so you can you can integrate this from any value a to b and it will give you the probability of finding an electron in that region of space so um, I just wanna I just wanna help us clear out terminology so now for two d systems. For 2D systems, psi depends on x and y. So then um, the probability of finding an electron in, um, when in, in 2D space would be given by two integrals. So you would have psi x and y squared. And now your volume element is dx dy. Right? So there's two integrals because there's two differentials. So each differential, so basically, um, really what this is is that, you know, one of the integrals you're going to be solving just with x, dx, and the other integral you're just going to be solving with dy. So it's nothing really too hard. It looks hard, but it really isn't. So now let's say, um, what if you have 3D space and then psi is a function of x, y, and z, right? In this case, the probability of finding an electron in this um, 3D space is given by a triple integral from A to B, A to B, and uh, you could change these bounds to something else. I'm keeping it very consistent right now. Um, and this is how it will look like. And here the volume element is dx, dy, and dz. So you can see that it can get very tiring to write dx, dy, dz. So many times what we'll do is we'll call this volume element d tau. Okay, d tau. So d tau is equal to dx, dy, dz. So what we can do is we can rewrite this integral as this. Okay. So with this, I just wanted to show you how we'll be proceeding to, um, with this I want to show you how we'll be finding probabilities, how we'll be writing out our equations, the logic we'll be using. So go over this, um, make sure you understand these basic principles because we're going to start building on these pretty soon.